We will now start the session on entrepreneurship born or learned. May I invite Mr. Anthony Nightingale, Managing Director of Jati Matheson Limited, Professor Po Chi Wu, Adjunct Professor, School of Business and School of Engineering, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, and Dr. Jack Lau, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer, Perception Digital Holdings Limited, proceed to the stage. Mr. Nightingale, the floor is now yours. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sure you'll all agree with me that was um, a spectacular and stimulating session. Yeah, why not? We can give them another clap. <laughs> In this session, which I'm sure is going to be equally exciting, we're going to discuss the topic, actually Vincent touched on it, entrepreneurship, born or learned. And we have with us two speakers perfectly equipped to discuss this subject. Beside me are Dr. Po Chi Wu and Dr. Jack Lau. Both of them are professors, and both of them are entrepreneurs. Po Chi has moved from venture capital to academia, and Jack has made the journey in the opposite direction. Dr. Po Chi Wu is now an adjunct professor in the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. He is a 30-year veteran in the international uh, venture capitalist field, who's lived and worked both in the United States and in Asia. He was a co-founder and managing director of Dragon Bridge Capital, and over the years he has invested in several companies which eventually grew into billion-dollar enterprises. Dr. Jack Lau, in 1999, founded Perception Digital Holdings Limited. Perception Digital, a factoryless consumer electronics design house which specializes in design supply chain management and digital single signal processing. I hope all of you understand exactly what that means. If not, I'm sure Jack will tell us in a moment. In 2010, it became the first Hong Kong University and Technology Associated Startup to be successfully listed on Hong Kong's growth enterprise market. Prior to that, as I mentioned, Jack had a successful academic career, including a time as an adjunct professor at HKUST. Ladies and gentlemen, I will invite our two speakers to the podium in turn, and following their presentations, we will have a question and answer session. So please think up any questions or comments that you want to make so that I can address them to our two speakers. So first, please join me in welcoming Dr. Po Chi Wu. Po Chi. Thank you very much, Anthony, and uh, thank you very much to the organizers of this event, and uh, of course to Vincent as well. It's a, it's a great pleasure for me to, uh, to uh, offer you some of my thoughts. Um, first, I, I want to uh, call attention to my title. Oh, okay. Oh, there we go. Thank you very much. Um, it's important because I want to share the reason for this title. Now, first of all, I could say I have a personal perspective which is, you know, last week was uh, Valentine's Day, and my wife happens to be an entrepreneur and, and quite successful one in a very small way, very small business uh, in San Francisco. So that's one, one reason why I love entrepreneurs. On a professional level, <laughs> on a professional level, of course, um, uh, as a venture capitalist, um, it was and, and continues to be my passion to work with people who are really committed uh, to, uh, to do what they do. And I want to explain that 
Um, because I think the, the, the last reason for, uh, and of course now that I'm, I'm teaching, uh, the university is very kind. They invite me to teach new courses every uh, semester, uh, in both in the business school, uh, undergraduate, graduate level, and in the engineering school, also undergraduate and graduate level. But actually, I'm only teaching one subject. I'm teaching innovation and entrepreneurship. And I just dress it up in some different contexts, and I'll explain why that is. But the real reason, the, the most important reason, I hope why I'm here, is that this is a sign of respect. Okay? I, I have a deep respect for entrepreneurs, for all of you here who are entrepreneurs, for the young students that I get to uh, work with, because I, I really think this is something that um, uh, is not recognized enough. And this is that entrepreneurs love learning. This is really important, right? They love learning. They want to apply what they learn they want to innovate. They want to create economic and social value. Of course, for themselves, but really social value, right? Businesses, as you heard from Cher, businesses exist to create value for society. So this is a very important uh, concept. And of course, it's all about, uh, as Cher is an absolutely outstanding example, it's a tribute to the human spirit, right? It's a tribute to not only surviving, which is kind of where most people start, but also thriving and creating opportunities for other people. Right? So this is what I'm talking about, both economic and social value. Okay? I think that entrepreneurship is an absolutely fascinating subject. It's really all about character development. It is logically inconsistent. So if you think about entrepreneurship from a purely rational point of view, and you analyze it, as many of us are very good at doing, you find a lot of opposites. Right? On the one hand, entrepreneurs must be very stubborn and very passionate, very dedicated to their own ideas, their own beliefs uh, about the business I'm referring to. Um, but at the same, and, and that, of course, is their uniqueness. But at the same time, they're trying to create a business that has products and services that will be appreciated by a lot of people. So there's an element of commonality that they're seeking. At the same time, they're trying to be unique. The balance between thinking and doing is probably one of the most uh, challenging aspects of being an entrepreneur. And perhaps I bring a, a slightly different perspective, being somewhat uh, academic about it. Uh, I probably analyze too much. Uh, and of course, my own personal history is that I was a much better uh, venture capital investor than I was an entrepreneur. And the reason is very simple. I think too much, right? So sometimes thinking too much, knowing too much, being very disciplined about your planning won't get you to where you need to be as an entrepreneur. As Cher mentioned, it's really about being very passionate, being driven by passion. Now, Vincent uh, asked Cher about why she gave up playing the piano. Well, as it turns out, I spent many, many years playing the piano, very seriously. Uh, my undergraduate degrees are in mathematics and music. So music is definitely one of my passions. Uh, but I also gave it up for good reasons. Um, but it is in my heart. It is, it is part of what, what drives me. And this is uh, also, again, the point I want to reinforce about uh, uh, being an entrepreneur. Is, it is very much about um, uh, character development. It's about who you are, how you show up in the world, what you want to contribute to the world. And it is this dynamic balance. It's, it's this urgency, this drive uh, to, to, to find this balance so you can be productive, um, both for yourself, of course. We, we are all driven by whatever it is that drives us uh, individually, um, but also for society. And remember that the path for uh, entrepreneurship is about innovation, and innovation is fundamentally unpredictable. So most entrepreneurs, and I'm sure Cher and, and both Vincent would agree, you kind of have to make it up as you go along. <laughs> you can have some strategic direction, you can have some sense of where you want to take things, but actually you cannot plan in a, in a very mechanistic, uh, deterministic sort of way. You really do have to have faith, whether it comes from religious faith or just your, again, business passion. But it is a, a process that is organic, it's dynamic, uh, it is something that has to come from within. So, 
sort of the first part of the answer, you know, are entrepreneurs born, uh, is it something you're born with or is it something you can learn? Clearly, there are characteristics you have to be born with. For example, I'm going to just use my own uh, case, you know, the tolerance for uh, ambiguity and uncertainty and therefore risk is, is, is a characteristic that each of you probably has to a different uh, level. Uh, and if you think about entrepreneurs, they have to be pretty much off the scale, right? They, they have to be really willing to put themselves, their ideas, uh, their money, and the energy uh, of, of their team, of their businesses, really out there to, to take that kind of chance. Um, and sometimes it pays off and sometimes it doesn't. So what drives an entrepreneur? Well, again, you know, after listening to Cher, uh, number one, I'm very inspired. Um, but two, it's sort of, you know, I have to keep thinking about what am I going to say differently now <laughs> because she's covered a lot of really important points. So um, I was thinking that, you know, maybe I should have called the title of this talk Gift or Curse, right? Because you have to think about this idea of being an entrepreneur, taking these kinds of risks. Uh, you know, a rational person really doesn't want to be an entrepreneur. Why, why would you want to do that? It's risky. Why not just go work? Work for your father. Go work for a big company. Go go work for the government. You know, um, and and those are entirely valid positions, valid questions. Um, uh, it is true that uh, many entrepreneur uh, n there are many entrepreneurial startups every year, but many of them fail. Right? In, in the United States, it is something like I forget what the numbers are. Something like seventy five percent that fail within five years. It, it, it is really horrible if you look at it from a short-term point of view. From a longer-term point of view, you have to understand that entrepreneurs think about failure. They reframe it com completely. It, it's, not, um, it's not a fatal mistake. It's not something you go and commit harikiri for yourself. You know, it's, it's not that bad. It's actually very, very important. And this is one of the things I emphasize to my students. Instead of being afraid to try because you might fail, you have to understand that in order to create something new, you have to learn something new yourself first. And that means inevitably that you will do things that don't work, that don't meet your expectations or don't meet other people's expectations. If they want to label that as failure, that's perfectly OK. Everyone's entitled to their opinion. For you as an entrepreneur, you have to look at it as, wow, this is a great learning experience. I am going to learn so much. And, and I think that was one of the things um, uh, that came out in, in Cher's talk about her very first big challenge. You know, after learning what, that, what she had to do to uh, go through that, uh, build her character. I mean, it was a very early uh, event in her life, in her business life, and it's really shaped, uh, I'm sure, uh, how she has become successful. So, you know, what drives an entrepreneur, I use crazy because it's shorter and you know, I can get bigger print, you know. But, but obviously it is about passion. Uh, people want to prove themselves. People want to leave a legacy. Uh, of course, it is about money. People want to make money. But there is a strong, plain, stubborn streak. You just have to want to do it because it's important to you. And that's another way of saying passion. And so, you know, there's a, a good question. Instead of talking about whether this is an inborn talent or, or something that you learn, you know, you can ask the question, how much free will does an entrepreneur have to choose that path, right? Do they ask why or do they ask why not? All right. One of the things that this chart is supposed to show is this is kind of how I think about the world that entrepreneurs live in. And I call this a bio-ecosystem, right? Of course, ecosystem is a very well uh, understood concept, but actually many people misunderstand. Uh, and you know, I, I've done some consulting for some of the science parks uh, in China and in other countries. And uh, a, a lot of particularly government officials, and I mean this uh, with no criticism intended, uh, confuse the idea of infrastructure and ecosystem. Infrastructure is physical stuff. Roads, buildings, power, and so on and so forth. Things that you can buy and you can build. An ecosystem, particularly a bio ecosystem, is driven by human energy. It's driven by people. 
You know, you need a, a strong leader who has a vision, has drive, uh, and you have to bring enough people like that together to create what I call this bio-ecosystem. So the one thing that I'd like to point out, because this is, of course, entirely obvious, all of you understand this, but it's the way I want to present it that I'd like to just highlight for you. And the most important piece, I think, is this mentoring piece. Right? Having been a successful venture capitalist in Silicon Valley, uh, I have been asked over you know, the last couple decades uh, in a number of countries around the world, you know, how can we create a Silicon Valley here? You know, Hong Kong, Beijing, Singapore, Japan, in Europe, and so on and so forth. And I think the biggest uh, need that is unfulfilled is this mentoring piece. And of course, we understand mentoring, and again, you know, both Vincent and Cher talked about that. What, and this is the, the question I asked myself when I was first invited to teach at Beijing University uh, three years ago before I came to Hong Kong. And the question is, what can I, with my experience, offer to students? or to young people. If I'm not going to teach just content, because I can't teach content. I mean, what, what am I going to teach them about innovation entrepreneurship? I need to help them have an effective learning experience of what it means to be innovative and entrepreneurial. So from experience, the only thing that I can offer them that they cannot get on their own, right? Because remember, they can learn the content. They can learn a new programming language. They can learn about semiconductors. They can design smartphones. They can do all of that on their own. But they do need guidance. And they need guidance from people who can show them context and perspective. Because that's something you can only get from experience. So that's what I offer. And, and of course, the conclusion is, you know, you need all of these things, right? You need to be inspired, uh, you know, to create a successful entrepreneurial venture. You need timing, market timing, technology timing. You need a tremendous amount of courage. You'll hear that over and over again. And of course, you have to be very resourceful. So what I'd like to leave uh, with all of you is that uh, this is a prescription for success as an entrepreneur. So I'd like to leave with you a challenge for society, right, which is all of you, um, which is how can we provide an environment that encourages entrepreneurship? And clearly that's the theme of, of today's conference. And then, you know, go one step deeper, which is how do we provide that effectively? So thank you very much for your attention. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much, Po Chi, for that um, thoughtful and uh, fascinating uh, speech there. I look forward to following up some of those themes in a moment or two. But now, ladies and gentlemen, can you please join me in giving a warm welcome to our second speaker, Dr. Jack Lau. Jack, over to you. It's always fun to speak in front of an audience and uh, seeing so many friends in Hong Kong, but uh, especially lovely to see Loletta here. I'm going to talk a little bit about entrepreneurship and um, born or learned. Um, that's the topic. My name is Jack. Um, just for information, I was a CPU engineer designing 3D7 and 4D6 um, here, but um, didn't get to go the path that you did. Um, um, when Vincent called me and talked about entrepreneurship, I thought it's sort of odd because in Hong Kong there's so many other entrepreneurs. But then I figure I'm sort of an oddball because uh, I used to teach. I, am a I was a professor in electronic engineering in Hong Kong and later on decided to start my own business and had a little success uh, in doing digital signal processing, uh, which most of you won't understand any, th any about. Um, Anthony, I'm going to talk about your ice cream business a little bit later. Um, but then, uh, after receiving the call, I decided to do a bit of research, and I decided uh, to go to Amazon.com and then type entrepreneur, and I found out there are about 16,000 hits on books. So I figured this must be a um, very important topic. And uh, the top of the list of the book that I saw, it's a book by the name, uh, the title, The Toilet Paper Entrepreneur. The tell it, like it, it is guide to cleaning up your business even if you are at the end of your role. 
So um, that basically summarizes uh, how people think about entrepreneurship. Um, but really, uh, born to learn. So I'm going to say a few things about my own experience, and this is a very important picture. This is a defining moment, defining moment of my, uh, of my odd years of experience later on. Um, the dude in the middle uh, who is smiling uh, actually was me. <laughs> the guy on the left uh, is my brother who is five years my senior and who always beats me up, even now. Uh, and the, uh, the lady behind me um, is my mother. Uh, actually, she's a tigress. Now, why I said this is an important moment in my life, because behind the scene, as I, was, as I was told later on, was that I was actually crying. And my mom actually told me and start negotiating with me, even though I was one year old, uh, if I stopped crying, I could have the cake and eat it too, and be able to blow up the candle. And later on, my mom had a lot of influence on me. It turns out that I had to negotiate everything. Um, if I do well, I get a toy. If I do really well, I can choose my toy. And now if I do really, really beyond expectation, I can even go to the toy store of my choice. And the negotiation was always very difficult because I didn't know that I, they would find prints. Um, I still remember one time that I uh, negotiated with my mom again on some examinations in uh, primary school. And I was told that uh, if I do well, if I did well, I could get a, a model tank. Um, back then, as a boy, that was a big thing. I didn't realize that after I've surpassed the, uh, her expectation, and I walk up to her model tank. She said, but then there was no witness. We didn't sign a contract. <laughs> um, so you know, the negotiation went on and walked on. And then my brother George came in to the scene and told me that I could be your witness. <laughs> but only if you give me a share of your reward. <laughs> so I did wind up buying a model toy tank, but I didn't actually get to build it because the part of the negotiation was that I got to go to the store and pretend that I own the uh, model tank, but my brother would build it, own it, play with it, and destroy it later on. <laughs> so that's the story of my uh, tumultuous uh, childhood. The lesson I thought I could learn, born or learned, I don't know that was born or learned, but having a tigress mother and a brother who was always trying to uh, literally cheat on you, um, had definite significance on your desire to be an entrepreneur. Nowadays, when I do things, you bet you, I have lots of witness. I read all the fine prints and understand the cost structure extremely well. And I also have to say, today, I'm not afraid of my mother anymore because uh, despite the fact that I learned the lesson, never, never, ever even think about, ever underestimate any woman from Shanghai. The way I deal with it is that I married another woman from Shanghai. <laughs> so I get that squared away, and Catherine is now go, you know, getting along very fine with my, uh, my mother still. And then I decided that, you know, when Vincent called me, I talk about born or learned. And I decided that I look at the uh, guest list, the illustrious guest list, and I decided to do my feeble attempt in uh, brown nosing because who knows, maybe Cher would buy my company. Um, or Anthony may decide to give me a lifetime ice cream for free. So I decided that I need to be the center of the universe. Um, you know, that's how people without much confidence has to do. And I decided to uh, figure out the link between amongst all of us. Well, first of all, there's Vincent. You know, Vincent there. And I decided that he and I are related, uh, both having beautiful wives, but also, um, we uh, somehow affiliated with the university in Hong Kong, and also actually Vincent wouldn't you know, admit it, but we went to the same high school in Hong Kong. Um, and then Cher and I, of course, we went to Berkeley. And then Po Chi didn't realize it, we also went to Berkeley. And then Maria, first time I met you, I think somewhere she is Maria, uh, we went to Stanford together. 
And then, of course, Steve DeCray, uh, my MBA professor. Uh, we affiliate with HKUST. Why am I doing this? Well, when I did this, actually, it took me 30 minutes to do this. Um, other than being humorous, I decided that this would be something that most people will laugh at. Why the heck do you do this? You know, it is so boring, so trivial. This is not even worth it. And clearly, you are brown nosing. Um, but then, you know, why not? Since I've already spent 30 minutes, may as well spend another 15 minutes. And then it get really, really hard because um, some of the distinguished guests here I've never met. And their biographies, because Vincent's secretary called and said you should limit to 50 words, it's really difficult to decipher uh, all the achievements. So, but I, I did try my best. And uh, I was trying to link between myself and Anthony. And I realized that you know, her pedigree, his pedigree from Cambridge and mine from the West Coast don't really match exactly. Um, and I decided that, um, well, I like budget ice cream. And Anthony's dairy farm provided budget ice cream. So we became fans of dairy farm. And then Mark, because I'm a subscriber of Business Week, so I decided that we can be fans of Business Week. Now, this exercise is still very boring. Until I tell you this, if you like it, only if you like it, you'll be worth $90 billion US. <laughs> so you see, an exercise that's completely trivial, and I'm sure a lot of people will talk about it, became an idea. Became an idea so important that people are willing to fork out 90 billion US dollars. Actually, after I typed the numbers, I have to read the zeros a few more times because this is a number so astronomical that it's really difficult to understand. 90 billions for replicating what I just did for 45 minutes around the world. Now, after the Facebook phenomenon, there are so many social media sites that pop up. People talk about connecting to other people. It suddenly seems very fashionable, very rewarding financially as well. And I bet you there's so many people now doing social media sites not because they had a tiger's mother or a brother who always beat you up, but because economically it becomes very, very lucrative and attractive. And why not? Because the cost of trying it is so low. So here's my um, statement for today to address the question, entrepreneur born or learned. I think the probability of becoming an entrepreneur is really a combination of childhood influence. And Cher described her childhood, um, her father, the loving father, maybe her religious faith, and her trial and error. I bet Cher would still have started a business, even not in technology, even she, not, even she did not go to Moscone Center and try the uh, 386 VIA board, which actually I had one when I was a kid. Well, I shouldn't say when I was a kid, that gives away my age. Um, but also, the social and economic factor. I really believe that you, know, you can be all the entrepreneur if you want, but if the society does not reward it, the justice, the legal system, the legal framework are not there to protect intellectual property, the stock market and the angel investors and the venture capitalists do not exist to reward economically the guy who wanted to start a business then it's really, really hard. So really my conclusion is the following. If you had not thought about entrepreneurship when you were young, it's really, really difficult. I hate to say this to you, Pochi. Entrepreneur is really, really difficult to learn. But what you can learn is about the technical framework, the balance sheets, the profit and loss statement, and how to read people, how to hire people. You can read all about all you want. There are 16,000 books that you can buy on Amazon.com that talk about entrepreneurs. But if you don't, haven't thought about this, it's going to be really, really difficult. So that's my statement for the day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jack, for a, um, a stimulating uh, amusing and also uh, thought-provoking uh, 
uh, speech there. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I hope uh, that we'll get some contributions from the floor, but let me kick off, because right at the end there, Jack, I think you came to a conclusion, which is probably the opposite one uh, to Po Chi, at least I guess uh, Po Chi, since you um, teach um, entrepreneurship these days, you must believe that it is something that uh, can be taught. Whereas, Jack, I think your conclusion was finally, it has to be inside you. So let's explore that a little bit. Um, what would be your reaction, uh, Po Chi, to uh, Jack's concluding statement? Um, actually, uh, that's not quite a correct interpretation of um, my position. Uh, I think we have a, a good de debate here, potential. Um, but what I'm saying is that you do have to be born with certain characteristics, and certainly that drive, that passion. Not everyone has that, and, and that's OK. Um, but beyond that, just I think is Jack's own example, there is a tremendous amount you have to learn. There is, there are, of course, about the mechanics and so on and about business and whatever. But what is more important, though, particularly in the context of Hong Kong uh, and, you know, greater China, is that the uh, culture, uh, values in the home, uh, values that you learn in school uh, actually do not support uh, the idea of entrepreneurship. So th there's a, a very interesting um, uh, paradox. Uh, I think, again, as Cher mentioned, there are just a tremendous number of entrepreneurs here, uh, and they start all kinds of businesses. Uh, and, and I'm not trying to restrict the idea of entrepreneurship only to technology businesses or, or sort of uh, high-tech uh, high things. Um, entrepreneurs in, in all fields uh, of business are, are possible and, and can thrive. Uh, the problem is that we, we don't acknowledge uh, the role that really uh, inspiration and, uh, and, and the, the, the support from the community uh, that is required. And, and I think that is uh, needed to draw out uh, talent. I think talent in, in any field, uh, in music, in, in sports, uh, and in business, uh, you have to have some talent, but the talent has to be nurtured. Thanks, Pochi. Jack, how would you uh, respond to that? Well, I, I, I really think that um, you have to have some DNAs in wanting to become entrepreneurs. I, I have never seen, in fact, the contrary. Um, I think most of the entrepreneurs that I met somehow have extremely strong, strong influence during their childhood. Of course, once in a while when opportunities stumble upon you, your friends insist that uh, you join Facebook. But really, that's an opportunity to stumble upon you. Um, you didn't go out your way to seek an opportunity. Um, you know, and Steve DeCray may, may, may hate me for saying this. The, the MBAs and the EMBAs are all great. We learn a lot, and I'm teaching there. But really, when you look at the students in their eyes and ask him, do you want to become an entrepreneur, if he, even, he or she even paused for a nanosecond, he, has, he or she has no chance. Okay, thanks, Jack. Uh, let, me, let me shift gear a little. Um, clearly in the world, over, as Cher gave several great examples, over the last 10, 20 years, there have been hugely successful entrepreneurs. But some, sometimes people say in Hong Kong, and after all, we have a largely Hong Kong audience today, sometimes people say it's much tougher to be a successful entrepreneur starting out in 2012 than it was, for example, not sure I can give exactly the date you started off, Vincent, but it was quite a long time ago. Um, what, do you, what do you both say to that? Is it harder in the Hong Kong of today than it was in the Hong Kong of the 1970s, or is it just the same? I think uh, trying to be successful in, in any direction is more difficult now. I, I would not want to be a young person just graduating from college and, and trying to figure out how to, how to uh, survive and thrive in, in this world. The uh, world is much more complex, it's much more dynamic. But, and this is the entrepreneur side saying, wow, you know, it's growing so fast. There's such uh, tremendous opportunities out there. And of course, China is part of it, but, but really the, the global uh, opportunities are immense. So I think that 
uh, even asking that question, uh, as I referred to in my, uh, in my slide, and I think this is where Jack and I absolutely agree, um, I don't think an entrepreneur thinks that way. They, they don't ask, why would I do it? They just, why not? There's opportunity out there. It's a challenge, but the flip side of challenge is opportunity. Um, since I was born uh, after 1980s, um, <laughs> just, just, just wish. Um, I, I really think that every year, uh, the people would say that, you know, younger generations, they're not as good. You know, we work harder. But I've heard that so many times from people of different ages. Um, I think that as long as the law and justice, the legal framework, the reward system are there, they'll be entrepreneurs. Um, you know, Facebook is a great ex example. Uh, just literally, you know, undergraduate hacking away on the software, YouTube being the same. Um, I think the nature of entrepreneurship would change. I don't know. I, I think that there are just so many opportunities there. Um, I bet you if we have a website that call, you know, I wish I could be like sharewang.com, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that I will draw some fans, really, uh, or, or for that matter, are there any of the people, or Jerry Lin, Jeremy Lim himself. So um, I'm very, very hopeful. I'm extremely hopeful. It's getting harder because of the globalization, but you know, we are humans, we have needs. So as long as there are human beings who have needs, there are people who need to address their needs. Thank you both. Now, I've now um, accumulated quite a stack of questions here, so I think I better, better um, staunch my curiosity for a while and turn to the questions from the audience. There's one, uh, Pochi, directed first to you, a rather specific question. A lot of successful entrepreneurs start their business before or without completing a formal education. If a student came to you, Professor, saying that he or she wants to quit university to start a business, what would be your advice? <laughs> okay, so that's a very relevant question because actually one of the students in our uh, global business program at UST uh, asked me to be uh, his faculty advisor and, and uh, his uh, senior project was in fact a business plan for a business idea that he is absolutely totally passionate about. And this young man was very impressive. I talked to him for about an hour uh, before I agreed to do it, but I found it uh, he, he was very, very engaging. And in, in a way, he was asking that question as well, although it was his last semester. So, I mean, you know, at that point, it, you, you just finish up your degree. Now, uh, one of the points that I didn't emphasize uh, from my perspective is that uh, it is true that the formal education uh, may or may not be terribly uh, useful in terms of, of what you want to be as an entrepreneur. And being an entrepreneur, as I mentioned, is about timing. So when you're young and you're hot and you're passionate, uh, you know, maybe that is a time that, that you need to, uh, uh, to follow that passion. Now, the, the problem is this. Um, as, as we both indicated, there are things that you have to learn. Now, one of the quirks of being an entrepreneur is that, as I pointed out, entrepreneurs love to learn. Okay? This is very, very important. They love to learn, but they want to learn by doing. They want to learn by direct experience. They want to be out there and learn, as we used to call, street smarts. Uh, often they're not very good academically. The handful that we uh, people think of, you know, a Mark Zuckerberg, a Steve Jobs, uh, Bill Gates, I mean, these are people one in a generation, uh, maybe two in a generation. Um, uh, very, very rare cases. You know, how many of us could, could even uh, believe that we have that same uh, potential or possibility? Now, it's not to say that every entrepreneur has to aspire to such high accomplishment, um, but you, you have to think about what do you do, uh, what do, what resources do you personally have to bring? To, uh, to your venture, okay? The, the, the thing about staying grounded that, that Cher pointed out is you have to have a dream, you have to aim very, very high, you have to have that high energy, but you have to be grounded. You have to understand who you are, what do you really bring? And 
you know, if you, if you drop out in the middle of school and you say, you know, this is my passion and I'm going to go do it, that's perfectly okay. And, and I would encourage someone to do that only if they could really see that experience as a learning experience. Okay, this is the answer that I give to many students who ask me, you know, when I graduate, should I take job A or job B? And the, the answer, instead of telling them, of course, I don't advise them on any particular choice, is think about not just what the benefits might be or what the down, downside risk might be, or the weaknesses, the strengths and weaknesses. We all know how to analyze that. Think more importantly, what will be my experience if this works out? And what will be my experience if this does not work out? And I think that's the most important advice that you can give to entrepreneurs. That sounds uh, very wise ad advice, Po Chi. Now, Jack, um, uh, clearly uh, someone in the audience like, like I did in enjoyed your uh, family stories and uh, wants continuation. So here's a question directed specifically to, d to you. Uh, given that he came from a similar environment, did your brother become an entrepreneur? Um, well, my, my brother eventually became a medical professor um, in medical school. I think uh, he walked down the wrong path. Um, I think that he definitely had the DNA, uh, and I think that as a he applied he applies entrepreneur or innovative DNA in some of the fields, um, you know, uh, innovative medicine and things like that. Uh, no, the answer is 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 no. In fact. Um, but we still uh, uh, talk to each other a lot and brag about our achievements all the time. So there's a continuous uh, uh, competition uh, between the two of us. But this time, you know, he has probably no, not much chance to, to beating me. Thank you, Jack. Now I've got a question for you, for you both, a rather uh, kind of practical one. Um, I want to be a successful entrepreneur. Where can I find relevant information and resources like practical guides to start a business and get some professional advice. So, professors, how would you respond to that one? Uh, you know, I'll, I'll say it first. Um, I, I really think after all this time about uh, entrepreneurs and, uh, they are, you know, once in a while there are people walk up to me and, and ask me about why I want to start a business why I don't remain at the university and teach. And if you have been to HKUST, you'd realize that it's a really tempting environment uh, never to leave that place. Um, but my, my, my advice is that don't ask so many questions. Just, just follow instinct and just do it. You know, if you start asking questions, it's way too late. And, and it's really, it's better to fall early on when you can afford to fall. And go back up again and keep trying. You know, um, professors are great to talk to, um, but, you know. Po Pochi? <laughs> right, professors tend to talk too much. <laughs> and about philosophical abstract ideas. Um, so, uh, but more seriously, I, I had a, a chart that I thought was very useful. Again, I think the entrepreneurial drive, I, I actually agree with, with Jack. Um, in, the, in the following sense. Um, the slide I put up about this, what I call the bio-ecosystem. You know, uh, if an entrepreneur, no, not if, when an entrepreneur has decided to pursue a particular direction, whether it's a, um, a, you know, a company in, in, in digital signal processing, uh, smartphones, or an ice cream shop, um, that passion uh, needs to express itself in wanting to learn everything about that industry, everything about all your competitors, everything about the suppliers, everything about the technology, everything about everything that they could possibly learn about that industry. That is essential. If, if they start off with that position, then they will naturally begin to develop the relationships with individual people that some of whom will become mentors, some will be very fierce competitors. But guess what? You learn more from your competitors than you will from some faculty at HKUST or HKU or any other university. So it's not so much the formal titles, the formal um, setting 
of, of a resource that's important. What's important to an entrepreneur is what is the relationship of this uh, person? What is this person uh, that they're seeking help from, this mentor? What is the relationship of that position to what I am trying to accomplish? Thank you. Uh, Jack, another one for you. If entrepreneurship cannot be learned, why did you enlist in business school? And how did the knowledge in your MBA education enhance your business? I, I'm sure that's a question from Decray. Must um, be Steve, right? <laughs> when I say it, just, just, that's, that's his handwriting for sure. Um, really, when I say just do it, that's the, in, that's the beginning. Entrepreneurship, of course, you have to immediately start whenever you have an idea. When you're frustrated with whatever you're seeing, go try it. But as it grows, you need to have the discipline. There are lots of technical aspects to growing a business. And I think the MBA and the EMBA or whatever discipline, law degree, accountancy, those are very, very important. Otherwise, you can start it. You can get somewhere but you will never be a great and big business. Look at Google. Well, we talk about Google, it started by engineers, but look, they had a mentor. They hired someone, Eric Smith, to help them actually grow the business to its scale because an idea is great, but how do you monetize it? Um, you probably need some formal discipline. So I, I wouldn't say uh, business education is not important, but I'm saying that along the way, you have to have the business education and discipline. But the desire, the fire in you must start the engine first. Thank you, Jack. A slightly different tack. How much, and this is really addressed to you both, how much do you feel cultural factors impact on entrepreneurship in, in a society? For example, some European countries or Japan are said to not encourage taking risks, while in the United States, it's felt that failures are common and generally acceptable. Um, talking very broadly, do you feel that cultural factors have a significant influence on the, uh, on the creation of successful entrepreneurs in a society? Yeah, the short answer is definitely. Uh, and I think I, I did mention that already. Um, uh, <coughs> In terms of broad generalizations, yes, different cultures, such as in Europe, you know, venture capital has always had a, a great challenge in Europe uh, in finding entrepreneurs uh, that would have both the vision and the courage and, uh, and, and, and really that fire to, to want to create those kinds of businesses. Um, uh, there are other aspects of culture beyond sort of the, the personal dynamics of culture. Uh, there are things like the uh, financial, uh, entire financial infrastructure, uh, the ability to support these companies as they continue to grow. And that means the banks and, and investment bankers and, uh, you know, stock exchanges and so on. Um, so uh, entrepreneurship on, on a small level uh, is relatively straightforward. I mean, you know, we can start a... Um, a coffee shop or a, um, a selling ice cream. Uh, th those are relatively uh, simple, uh, rather contained, I would call them sort of community-focused businesses, if you will. But if you want to create a, a smartphone company that's going to sell hundreds of millions of units uh, around the world, that's a very different problem, uh, problem or challenge. Uh, and it requires a very different culture, uh, both on a personal level and uh, in terms of, of what the culture itself can provide. Thanks, Pochi. Jack? Um, I, I think that unless it's in extreme context, when you have a culture that really suppressed individualism, um, I think that since we're all human beings, I really firmly believe that as long as they're human beings, there will be needs. And as they are needs, people will address them. And people will reward those people who address those needs. I think that's, so therefore naturally, there will be an entrepreneurship. There will be entrepreneurs. But of course, in the very extreme cases, um, in extreme culture, uh, that's the opposite. But I think maybe 80, 95% of the culture uh, will be conducive to entrepreneurship. Thanks, Jack. Now I've, um 
coincidentally got two questions that uh, have come up at this moment that um, are very, very similar. Uh, so let me address them to you both. Um, and it is, um, many entrepreneurs start their businesses when they're young. Do you think a man, it could be, I guess, a lady too, who is trained in a big corporation and passes the age of 35, still has a chance to open his own company? And the other question is, what would be the right time to start? Is it too late to start in the early 30s? So, um, Jack, do you want to go first this time and then uh, Po Chi? That, that's, that's very difficult to uh, answer a question. I don't know 35, 34, 31, 30, 29, 18, what is the right age? But, you know, I, I really reiterate what I firmly believe. Uh, is if you think that you have a chance, the best thing to do is just go start it right now, immediately. Don't even pause for a moment. Don't even ask around. Don't ask this question. Just go ahead. You would know. Because, the, the, you know, the truth is, you would know. If you are passionate about what you want to do, you'll get somewhere. It may not be as big as Google. It probably won't be as big as Google. Um, but you'll get somewhere. And it's probably better than a desk job. So that's <laughs> what I think. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> I, I agree with uh, Jack's uh, answer. Uh, and, and I laughed because I thought he was going to get to the punchline uh, much earlier, which was, you know, you shouldn't even ask the question, just, just go do it. Um, however, the, the problem with, uh, with that, from a rational uh, standpoint, since we're, we're going to discuss this, is that uh, the older you get, uh, one, you, you, you've been thinking a lot longer about all the things that, that make things hazardous, uh, about the risks. Uh, you may have a family. Uh, so so there, there are indeed more practical constraints. Clearly, when you're young, you're a college student, you're in your early 20s, you have the least to lose, right? And you have the most to gain from every learning experience. You will have a learning experience, and it will always be valuable. No question about that. The issue is, at what cost? At what cost to you? And if you have a family, what cost to you know, your wife and children, whatever? And that's not something you can take lightly. Because this is about character development. Okay? Everything you do in life is about your character development. How you become a, a more, uh, how you, you, you create the ability to contribute more, to leave more behind to society, hopefully, than, than you know, existed before you did what you could do. And so you have to be careful about this responsibility part. And this is the, probably the most important incentive when you're young. And the other thing is, when you're young, you bounce back more quickly. And you are more open to seeing life as a learning experience. And you're more eager for that. And it's easier for you to go up to someone like a Cher or even Vincent and say, hey, Vincent, you know, can you give me some advice? Now, he may or may not talk to you, but, but at least you, you don't have that fear. One of the problems as you get older and with knowledge and with thinking is you develop more fear. And fear is the entrepreneur's greatest enemy. You cannot be afraid. You have to understand that sometimes you're not sure of things and, and you, you may feel uh, uncomfortable. You may feel extremely uncomfortable. But it can't be really fear. Because the minute you have fear, your entire spirit shrinks. Your creativity goes down. This has been proven. This is research from neurophysiologists and psychologists. There's a, a huge body of scientific knowledge that actually validates this. When you're happy, when you're optimistic, when you're cheerful, you are more creative, you are more innovative, you are more able to have the kinds of relationships that will help you be successful in whatever you choose to do. But every time you go into fear, then everything shrinks and you are building a cycle that will only take you down. Uh, don't, don't listen to him. <laughs> don't, don't think too much. The government is, has already given each of us $6,000 Hong Kong. Swindle a few more from your friends and, 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 and let that become your startup capital. Just do it. <laughs> Spoken like a true entrepreneur. <laughs> do whatever it takes. Well, we're getting quite, quite close to the end here, but I think um, we've got time for just a couple more questions. Um, one, um, uh, one is um, from a student, and it says, I'm a student entrepreneur. You're both relevant to academia. 
We have to admit, most talented people from the universities in Hong Kong go into banking or consulting. How to change the current scenario in Hong Kong? How to stimulate the entrepreneurial cu culture among students nowadays? What would be your thoughts? Hong Kong is uh, only 100 square kilometers. Um, you, you really have to think in a bigger, or whoever asked that question has to think of a bigger context. Um, Hong Kong is uh, very unique in the sense that we have been somewhat self-sustained. Uh, you were born in Hong Kong, you get married in Hong Kong, you start a family in Hong Kong, you work in Hong Kong. But really, um, Hong Kong is really 100 square kilometers. Um, nowadays, going across the border, uh, it's, it's very trivial. Um, and um, you, you really, you know, the academic thing, um, you know, of course, I, I didn't leave school until I was like 20 something, cl close to 30 something. Um, so when I was making joke about the university and academic uh, academia, I was really somewhat regretting that I started late. So um, Hong Kong is very, very small. Think, think of a broader context. Uh, okay, so that that clearly is is number one. Um, I think even even in the Hong Kong context, because you know clearly that's the the, the big big answer is, is you have to broaden uh, what you think of as opportunity and and give yourself um, uh, more space. You know, being innovative and being entrepreneurial requires space, physical space, spiritual space, uh, a sense of opportunity, and and. The, the more you, again, you limit that, and, you, and if you perceive that these are limits that the culture or society uh, puts around you as constraints, uh, then, then you are, again, you know, it's like, it's like they, they say, fighting with one hand tied behind your back. So, so, you know, the first thing you have to do is really give up those, those constraints, give up those fears, uh, and, and look at uh, what you think are opportunities. What opportunities can you create? Not what opportunities are already out there. Okay? Too much of our society and unfortunately our formal education process is saying, well, this is the way society is. Find a way to make your spot in this uh, matrix or this environment. An entrepreneur has to be driven by a different, uh, different tune, which basically says, OK, instead of saying, this is a society and this is where I'm going to fit, how am I going to create something new? How am I going to create a space? How am I going to um, uh, put my unique uh, value uh, in, in, in this context so that I can do something uh, that's different and that's more satisfying? Again, not only for me, but for others. And, and so really, you have to look at the question from a different perspective. Thanks very much, Pochi. Now, I think I've got um, the right question here to finish up this session, and it's addressed to you, Jack. As an entrepreneur, how do you measure your success? Regardless of how successful society perceives you, at what point do you sit back and think, I've done it? I've achieved my goal. I've done what I set out to do. Um, you know, in the, uh, in the ordinary world, people will ask you how much money you make, and that seems to be the... Uh, the, uh, the way that people gauge you. But I, I really think that, well, since I don't have much money, um, that's really not the way to measure um, your satisfaction. Um, entrepreneurship, I think that most people want to start something. They have to be very passionate. They have to really enjoy what they do. Um, recently, I picked up the game of golf, and I realized that I am totally hopeless. So I went back to the lab and invented an electronic device, which I will launch very soon, and enable me to uh, hit better, swing better, but I don't know. But really, that makes me really happy, because I realized that uh, my skill set is put in place, and I can fulfill my dream of building things, of really putting my beliefs and passion in work. And that's all that matters. Um, of course, if, if there were a few more zeros on the balance sheets, on the positive side, that would be good. Um, but that's really secondary, I think. So am I happy? Am I successful? I ambassadorly tell you that I'm extremely successful because I get to do what I really enjoy doing. Thank you.
Thank you, Jack. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm sure you'll agree with me that was a, a great session. And thank you all for being a very uh, participative audience. There were, in fact, a few questions I wasn't able to ask there, but they kept coming fast and furious. So thank you for that. And thank you, Pochi, and thank you, Jack, for some great insights as well as some amusing anecdotes. And I'm sure we've all uh, learned a lot and got a lot of food for thought. It's now time for a coffee break. But before that, please join me in giving a big hand and a big thank you to the two gentlemen behind me.